In this video, I'd like to talk about GLOR, Memory Efficient LLM Training by Gradient Low Rank Projection, which gives you the ability to train a whole LLM from scratch using a single GPU. And yes, you've heard it right, using a single RTX 4090D with 24GB of memory, now we can train an LLM from scratch with batch series of 256. How crazy is that? So let's just talk about it. Initially, I'd like to talk about LLM memory issues, and just to give you an example, let's just talk about LAMA 7 billion, which has 7 billion parameters, and let's just talk about the amount of memory we need to store throughout training. We need 14 gigabytes for trainable parameters. Why 14? Because if we have health precision for each parameter, we need like 2 bytes, and we have 7 billion, so we have 14 gigabytes only for the trainable parameters. And in addition to this, we have 42 gigabytes for Adam optimizer states and weight gradients. And why is that? Because if you remember Adam, we have two additional things in addition to gradients. One of them is this M for first order momentum, and the other is this V for second order momentum. And each of them has the exact same shape as the gradient. So we know that the gradient has the exact same shape as the trainable parameters. So gradient requires 14 gigabytes. This M requires another 14. This V requires another 14. So on the whole, we need 14 times 3, which is 42 gigabytes for the ADAP optimizer. And in addition to all of this, we have 2 gigabytes for the activations. So on the whole, we need 58 gigabytes for the memory usage which is more than any usual GPUs that we have out there, except some of the exceptional ones like A100, which is not easy to afford. So to kind of mitigate the issue that we are dealing here, people have focused on reducing the number of trainable parameters, this 14 gigabytes that you are seeing here, by training a subset of parameters instead of the whole parameters. And one of the most popular techniques is what we call LoRa, low rank adaptation that throughout pre-training it does it in a usual way and then we freeze the pre-trained weights and we add two new matrices A and B. That if we multiply B and A, we come up with the same matrix as the matrix W, but these two separately have less parameters than the original matrix W and we only tuning them instead. So we have a formula like this that the activation H is the original matrix W plus some new weights that we tune at this B and A and some new hyperparameters alpha and R which is the rank. I'm not going to talk about this LoRa technique here. If you're interested to know more, I have another video post GPT which you can go and see the LoRa section to understand more how this method works. So assuming you know how LoRa works, Let's just talk about the limitation of LoRa. The first paper that mentions about one of the limitations is this paper Chain of LoRa, which says, despite its advantages, LoRa falls short of full parameter fine-tuning in terms of generalization error for certain tasks. Meaning that if I have a full rank H equals WX and LoRa, which is H equals W plus BAX, disregarding those hyperparameters alpha and r, then at the end this full rank method has a better performance, which kind of makes sense. We are having more weights that we are updating and it is easier for the model to converge to a more optimal state. And another limitation of LoRa is what ReLoRa mentions in its paper that says typically we have a pre-training a stage and fine-tuning a stage. And in pre-training, we pre-train our large language model with a large corpus of data. And throughout fine-tuning for our specific downstream task, we tune it, right? So for pre-training, usually people have high amount of resources. So they use full rank. And for fine-tuning, they use LoRa and tune a subset of ways for their downstream task. And this method for sure works. That was the objective of the LoRa paper. But this paper says, what happens if I use LoRa throughout pre-training? So if I use LoRa in both stages, we actually fail. And instead, they said, if we 
Start with full rank and train it for some epochs and then use Laura throughout pre-training and then for fine tuning we use Laura again, we are getting a reasonable performance. So what is the issue that I cannot use Laura throughout pre-training? This galore paper has two hypotheses and it says it might be because the optimal weight matrices may not be low rank, which kind of makes sense. So by trying to optimizing them in a low rank space, we are actually updating it in a subspace, which is not have the flexibility to move in any arbitrary direction. So it is more difficult to converge to a more optimal state. And for the other reason, they say the repermutation changes the gradient training dynamics. And I'm going to talk about this more in this video. So what they propose here is GLOR, gradient low rank projection, that the idea is very easy to understand. They say, what do we do throughout the optimization? We have the W, the weight matrix, after T iteration, it is equal to what we initially had plus t times updating it using this g tilde. And what is this g tilde? In full rank that we are updating the whole parameters, we simply use this function rho t of g t. So this rho t could be the optimizer regularizer which for Adam was those first order momentum and second order momentum that I just showed you. And this GT is just the negative of the gradients that we want to move in the opposite direction to go towards the minimum. So in GLUR they say, instead of trying to project the original weight matrix into a low rank space, the same thing that Laura did, let's just do that for the gradients instead. So in the GLOR, the G tilde is this thing. So let's just say this G tilde has the shape of MN, the exact same shape of our original weight matrix. Then they propose two new matrices, P and Q. P has M times R and Q has N times R. So if you look inside this row T function, which is what the optimizer, let's say Adam, receives as the input, instead of being this GT, which is M times N, it now receives P transpose GQ. And what is the shape? We have M times R for the P, we transpose it, so it is R times M, multiplied by GT, which is M times N, and multiplied by QT, which is N times R, now it would be R times R. So if we have a thousand by thousand gradient, I can define a rank R to be something like 10, and instead of passing that thousand by thousand, I pass 10 by 10, which requires much smaller memory usage. And then a question would be, how can we come up with a good P and Q? And what they propose is just singular value decomposition of the gradient G. So having this gradient, I can use SVD to decompose it into three different matrices. And then I can use the columns of the matrix U for the matrix P and the columns of the matrix V for the matrix Q. And they have some theorems in the paper that they say having this constant P and Q, why it converges and why it has a solution in a low rank space, which I'm not going into those details. But this is the general idea that we project the gradient into a low rank space and for doing it we rely on matrix P and Q which come from the matrices U and V from singular value decomposition. So let's now compare this GLOR with LoRa once again. In GLOR we have the weight update and we project the gradient into a low rank space and we do it throughout the back propagation. But for LoRa we modify the weight matrix throughout the forward process and we say instead of modifying the weight matrix i can decompose it into an addition that we have an that i have an original initial weight matrix w0 and I, now i modify it with delta w 
and I decompose that delta W into matrix PA and I learn that PA. So that's one difference. But the other difference that they but the other difference that is more important and they focused on the paper is the difference in training dynamics. So let's just say this is the shape of the matrices that we have. So G and W both are M times N. And in Galore, I have P and Q, MR and NR. And in LoRa, I have BA, MR and RN. So they both rely on some term called rank. And they want to optimize it in a low rank space. One by projecting the weight matrix, the other by projecting the gradient. But the difference is, what happens if I don't rely on this low rank space? And I use, for example, in Galore, I define rank to be the minimum of M and N. And I kind of try to replicate the full rank behavior. The thing is, in Galore, I can do it correctly. Because if I do that and define this function rho to be an identity function, then I can see that at the right side of this equation, I have exactly m times n. But in LoRa, if I try to replicate the full rank, that is, if I want to use b to be m times m and a to be m times n, then the thing is, instead of updating the matrix m times n, now I have to update two different matrices, m times m and m times n. So optimizing these two matrices converges to a different solution than optimizing a single m times n matrix. Let's just say m is 1000, n is 10. So I have to optimize 1000 by 10, but here I have to update 1000 by 1000 and 1000 by 10. So I have actually more parameters in this case, and it converges to a different solution and has a different training trajectory. But in Galore, it doesn't happen. You might say, in Galore, I have P and Q, but P and Q are not learnable. You have to note that. P and Q are coming from the SVD, and in case that in SVD I use the whole columns, then it has no influence, and I have the exact same training trajectory. Hopefully it makes sense. And this is the main two differences between Glore and Lora. But in Glore, we have one additional note that we need to consider. So let's just say I want to update my weight matrices in a three-dimensional space using Glore. And I and by using Glore, I project it from 3D space to 2D space to kinda optimize in a low rank of space. So initially I have W0 as my initial weight and using Glore I find that this plane has an optimal direction for the gradient. Then I update it like four times and come up with something like this. But the thing is the actual solution doesn't exist in this plane. And after a couple iteration we reach a plateau that it is not gonna be optimized anymore because the better weight direction might be in another space, in another plane. So to kind of solve that issue, they say after a couple iteration, we can reinitialize the matrices P and Q to project the gradients into another space. And then we can move the gradients in that plane. And mathematically speaking, we need to replace the first equation with this equation that says wt is the initial weight plus delta wt1 in the first subspace, delta wt2 in the second subspace, and so on and so forth. And each delta w can be represented by multiple gradient updates in one hyperplane. So now in addition to the original hyperparameters in the optimizer, we have one additional hyperparameter which is what is the frequency that we need to change from one subspace to another? So let's just say the frequency could be four, meaning that in the first subspace, I need to apply this summation four times. 
uh, four times update the gradients and therefore the weights and then I move to the second hyperplane. And they have an interesting ablation study that compares the update frequency versus perplexity. And for those audiences that they don't know what perplexity mean, that's simply a measurement that measures the uncertainty of the large language model when it generates a new token averaged by the whole token generation. So that basically means the less perplexity is better because we are less uncertain for the result that we are producing. And looking at this figure, we see that both high frequency and low frequency is bad. Because when you're having a small frequency, that means I move the gradients like 10 times, and then I switch to the other cipher parameter, update 10 times, and do it so on and so forth. But they have a theorem in the paper that they say, for this gradient to converge in an optimized space, then we require this P and Q to be constant. But if I have a small frequency and I change them like after each 10 iterations, it doesn't match the theorem that they mentioned. And in addition, we also have some overhead because we need to compute this matrix P and Q after each 10 gradient updates, which actually makes the training slower. But on the other hand, if our update frequency is something like 20,000, that means I have to move the gradients 20,000 times and then I have to switch the hyperparameter into something else. But that's not also optimal because that is a lot. And in 2000 iterations, I will probably will have stuck in the local minima because I don't have the flexibility to move in any other directions. And after 20,000, if I change the subspace, then I need a lot of iterations, a lot of subspace changes to kind of solve that issue. And what they found is the value between 50 and 1000 is something suboptimal and we can use something between them. And the other thing is if I increase the rank from 64 to 512, we see that it is less sensitive to these frequency changes because I'm having more dimensions in the subspace and I have more flexibility to move in different directions which kind of makes sense. And the final thing to mention about this Glore update projection is reducing the memory usage of projection matrices. So they say in the paper to achieve the best memory performance trade-off, we only use one project matrix P or Q. And they project the gradient G into P transpose G if the number of rows is less than or equal to the number of columns and GQ otherwise. So that basically means if I have less number of rows than columns, then I kind of remove this matrix Q and this would be my gradient projection. And if I have more columns than rows, then I don't consider P and this would be my gradient projection. So now let's just talk about how we can apply this Glore to Adam Optimizer so, so as to have a better understanding of how this Glore works. So they have provided a pseudocode that uh, in the input they have one assumption that the number of rows is less than or equal to the number of columns, meaning that I only use the matrix P. And they define this step size, which is the learning rate, and a scale factor alpha, which is kind of similar to what we had in the LoRa, that's another hyperparameter, and we have decay rates beta 1 and beta 2 for the Adam, we have rank R, another hyperparameter, and the final hyperparameter is the change frequency T. So for this glur, we have three main hyperparameters, the scale factor alpha, rank R, and the change frequency T. So the way that we do it is that we initialize the first order moment and second order moment for the Adam optimizer. And then we initialize the step to be zero. And we repeat until some convergence criteria met, which could be some number of epochs. And for each iteration, what we do is that we calculate the gradients. And the negative of the gradients is stored in this matrix GT. And if the T mode capital T is zero, then that means that we have to change the subspace. So we calculate the 3D 
and we have some matrices U, S, V, and since the number of rows is not less than or equal to the number of columns, we only use P, and so the first R columns of matrix U goes to this matrix P. And in other case, then we simply use what we already had in the previous iteration. So we have a constant P in every other iterations. And what we do is that we have this gradient G, we project it into RT, which is the same gradient, but in a low rank space. And once we do it, we do this updates by Adam, the same thing that we had in Adam, except that instead of GT, now we have RT, which is the gradients in the low rank space. And finally, we project it back to the original space and update the weights. And then finally, we add the iteration number. And as the result, after the convergence criteria met, we return the WT. So now you should have some general understanding of how this color works, but they also combine this color with some existing techniques to further improve it. One technique is this 8-bit optimizer via blockwise quantization from ICLR 2022, that they quantize it in 8-bit and that stores less memory while it has kind of the same performance. And the way that they do it is that they say, let's just say this is the optimizer states, four numbers. Initially, they chunk it into blocks and they find in each block what is the absolute maximum value. For the first block, it is 3.1. For the second one, it is 1.2. And then they divide each block by this absolute maximum value and then they find the closest 8-bit value to each of those values. And once they found it, they find the corresponding indices. So assuming that I have 8-bit register, which can store a value between negative 1 and 1, I know that the first index would be for negative 1, and the last index, 255, would be for the 1, and these are the values in the middle. And once I have these corresponding indices, I will store these index values in addition to the absolute maximum values. This is the way that they do in quantization. So we store every optimizer state in only eight bits. And for the computation, we need to dequantize it to have the original values and put them in the optimizer. And the way that they do it is that they say, I have some indices as the input. I look up what are those values in the registers. When I found it, I denormalize it by the absolute maximum values and I have some decontus either optimizer states, which I can use those numbers to update the gradients. And you can see that these values that we see at the end are very close to what we initially had, which is kind of cool. And the other technique that they also use is from this paper, full parameter fine-tuned for large language models with limited resources, that they decrease the memory usage of the gradients substantially. And that's very also easy to understand. I promise that's the final thing that I'm gonna mention in this video that is technical, that they say, let's just say in mem we have some circles, that means that the things that I store in the memory and some dotted circles, that means I'm the things that I'm not storing them in the memory and the updated parameters are just some green circles. So initially, before applying this backpropagation, assuming that I have only three parameters, I have three things that I store in the memory, not the gradients. But once I say dot backward in PyTorch, it stores gradients for each of these parameters, the local gradients for each. And after updating them, we can clean these gradients so we have only the updated parameters, which are the screen circles. But the issue of this approach is that the memory of gradients is big O of n. So if I have n parameters, I have to store n gradients. So what this paper offers instead is an approach which they call it LOMO, low memory optimization, that they say before backward, I have something like this. So the thing I can do is that I can only compute the gradient for the last one, update the corresponding parameter, then I can move one step back compute the gradient for the second one, update the second parameters, compute the gradient for the first one, and then update the first parameter. So the memory of gradients now is a constant, which doesn't rely on the number, on the number of parameters that we have. So yeah, that was the general idea behind this paper. And Galore uses both of these ideas to further improve the memory.
And for a final comparison between Galore and Lora, we see that the weights in Galore is the actual weight that we had. Assuming that I have 14 gigabytes MN for the Galore, it would be the same thing. But in Lora, the actual parameter MN would be freezed. And they, in addition, they add this matrices A and B, which adds this MR and NR. For the optimizer states, assuming that I have less than or equal number of rows than the number of columns, then Glor says I have two NR, one NR for first momentum, the other NR for the second momentum in the Adam optimizer. And I also have one additional MR, which to be honest, I don't really understand why. If you know, please leave out in the comment. I will appreciate it. But that's for the Glore. For the LoRa, I have this matrix MR for B and NR for A. So for matrix B, I have two MR for first momentum and second momentum. And for matrix A, I have two NR for first momentum and second momentum. So on the whole, I have more memory compared to Glor on, on, on the optimizer states. And in addition, Glor supports multi-subspace because it changes the subspace after a couple iterations, but LoRa doesn't do it. For pre-training, I can use Glor from scratch and I converge, but with LoRa, I can't. And with fine-tuning, I can use either of them. And this is another Appalachian study, which is kind of cool. And they compared the rank versus perplexity. And for sure, if I increase the rank, then I have more flexibility to move, so I ended up getting a better perplexity. But the thing is, if I have rank 128 and I have 80,000 steps, then I have a better complexity compared to a 512 rank that I train at with 20,000 steps. So that means if I pick a lower rank, it is easier for me to fit it in a GPU memory, but then I have to train it for longer to achieve a comparable result with the highest rank. And talking about the results, they have used LAMA model and pre-trained it on C4 dataset with different number of parameters from 60 million to a billion. And you can see when I increase it from 60 million to a billion, perplexity decreases for sure. That's one thing. And the other thing is if I compare Galore with other methods like the original low rank or LoRa or, or ReLoRa, I can see that Glor always achieves the best performance. And notably, if I'm using 1 billion, I can see that the differences for the perplexity between Glor and the original full length is small. But for LoRa, the perplexity is higher than full rank when I'm using 350 million parameters. And the final thing to mention is that they have used a pre-trained Roberta base model and they evaluated on Glue benchmark, which has a lots of downstream tasks like question answering, sentiment analysis, and so on and so forth. And we can see that on both rank four and rank eight, on average, Glore achieves a better average performance compared to LoRa. And yeah, that's all the thing I wanted you to know about Glore. If you have enjoyed watching this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And until the next video, goodbye.